Hello and welcome to Westbrook Church Online. We are so glad that you are connecting with us today. Here at Westbrook, everything that we do circles around one or more of our markers of a healthy disciple, which are worship, connection, action, and practices. So we are super excited to let you know of some things that are coming up in the very near future. Next Sunday, August 7th, we have a couple of things that are coming up that are quite important, actually. Our first one is our Step Up Sunday. That means anybody who is in Westbrook Kids, your child or children, will be stepping up that weekend. So we urge you to be here in person so that those uh, the students can and the kids can have a successful transition into the next level, whether it's a different classroom or a different grade. Whatever it is, we want to be here next weekend so that we can help them through that process. We also have on August 7th from 6 to 8 p.m. our annual Splash Bash and that'll be held here in Bolingbrook at Pelican Harbor. From Again, that's from 6 to 8 p.m. We want you to come and join us. It's going to be a time of celebration, a time of fellowship. We have volleyball there. There'll be slides, swimming, lazy river for some who just want to relax. Um, but the, some great things that are happening in addition is that we get to fellowship with our brothers and sisters, not just from here at Westbrook, but also with our brothers and sisters from Gente Unida and Crossroads. So it's going to be a great night. And we'd want you to be there. The cost is $5 per person or $20 for a group of four or more. One thing as well that is crucial that night that's quite important is that we get to celebrate baptisms. So if this is something that the Lord is calling you to do, if he's calling you to get baptized, give us a call here in the office or email us at info at westbrook.church and let us know that you are interested in being baptized. That way we can follow up with you before August 7th and make sure that you have all the details. Ladies, this one's for you. We are having our monthly if table gathering and that'll be on august 13th from 9 to 11 in the morning our if tables is a time when the women gather together and we talk about questions about how the lord is calling you about what you're doing to just draw closer to the lord so it's just a safe place for us to connect and really get to know one another and deal with some questions that perhaps we don't have the opportunity to have those type of conversations outside so if you are interested in joining the if table make sure you register online by going to our church center app or you can go to westbrook.church as well and finally we have our fall rooted group starting up this fall and that'll be from september 7th to november 11th we are serious about discipleship here at westbrook and if this is something that you want to do it's a 10-week commitment it's not and if there you happen to not be able to make all the weeks, but maybe you can make it nine out of the ten. That's perfectly fine. We want you to be there. We want you to go through this experience of discipleship. And I know that some people have signed up in the past as well. If you have and haven't been able to make it through the whole process for whatever reason, we're asking you as well to join us. So if you are interested in joining our fall kickoff for Rooted, make sure you register online as well by going to the Church Center app or westbrook.church, or you can call us here at the office. 
All of this would not be possible, including having our church online, if it wasn't for the faithfulness of all of our givers. So we just want to continue to say thank you to you for helping us fulfill the mission that the Lord has given this church, which includes you, since the beginning of time. So thank you again for your continued faithfulness, and be encouraged that every time that you give, we pray and we ask the Lord to direct where every cent should be going. We want to make sure that it's not our plans that are being fulfilled, but it is what the Lord is calling us to do that we focus on. So rest assured that um, we are trying to be diligent in the way that we uh, allocate funds because we want to make sure that we do what the Lord is calling us to do. So please continue to be faithful, not just in your giving, but also in your attendance, whether it's online or, or in person. We'd love to connect with you and just thank you for joining us. Now let's take a moment and pray together. Father God, Lord, we want to thank you today. And I ask, Lord, that everyone who's connected with us online right now, Lord, that you prepare their minds and their hearts to receive the message that you have for them today. We thank you, Lord, for the offering that was given, Lord, and continues to be provided, Lord, because we know that that ultimately comes from you. And we thank you, Lord, that you trust us, Father God, to continue to be a part of this ministry. I ask, Lord, that you bless everyone who's connected online right now and just allow them, Lord, to be able to soak in your presence as we continue. We love you and we praise you. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Raise a hallelujah In the presence of my enemies Raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief Raise a hallelujah Praise the hallelujah, heaven comes to fight for me, I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm, louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar, up from the ashes, hope will
In college, I became addicted to a television show called Lost. How many of you have watched that show or were also huge fans of it? I remember watching the show from and being hooked from the very first episode, and then I would watch it with a group of friends every single week. This was in an era that a lot of younger generations don't understand, but you had to watch it on TV the night and the time that it was on, or you'd have to wait for maybe a rerun when you could catch it again, or for the box set to come out of the entire season, and then you could watch it from there. But when I started college, I hadn't really seen the show, and so my first year in college, I remember binge-watching the first two seasons of that show in time to start the third season. I remember spending each week in, in the dorms watching this show, and we would always go to um, the dorm dad's room to watch it, and he, we would be entranced by every episode. It felt like they kept adding new things every single week. They were adding more and more items to the storyline. 4, 8, 15, 16, 23, 42, the black smoke monster, polar bears, the protectors, the difference between ghosts and whispers, the visions, the full purpose of Dharma and more. Every single week, I remember looking at these things and trying to research a little bit more And I would try to figure out what this show was about. And each week, at the end of each episode, they would do a teaser of what was going to be on next. And they would say that they were going to answer questions next week. And so I would come back eager to see what questions were going to be answered, only to be disappointed to realize that they weren't answering any of those questions. And then, and then the finale came. And the finale was infuriating. They didn't answer any questions. They just tried to tie together all of the storylines and make it look like a nice story that had been told. And they ended on a note that made us think that maybe they could have been dead the entire time. I was livid, and I wasn't the only one. I remember many people being irritated by the ending of Lost. I I felt it. I felt like I had wasted six years of my life to a show that just left everything a mess. A few years later, the the creators of the show said that it wasn't really a show about a group of people stranded on an island. It was a show about a group of people who were lost in life and wandering without purpose, and the point of the show was to help them find that purpose. I've been thinking about re-watching the show and maybe watching it with that perspective in mind, but but I'm still a little irritated by how they ended everything, and I don't know if I could go through the entire show again. Maybe I missed the whole point of the show and got caught up in a lot of the details that I didn't need to focus on. I, I don't think so, but, but maybe I did. But have you ever felt that frustration of, of feeling like you might have missed the whole point of something? It was like that. I felt like I had invested time, mental energy, and it had all been for nothing because I supposedly missed the point of the show. And I'll concede and say that maybe I did miss it. But they did a pretty darn good job of making it easy to miss the point of the show. They kept on adding storylines and elements and different things that didn't make sense. They kept saying, we'll answer this, we'll answer this, and then they never did. I think I got so upset with it because I had dedicated so much time to it. I would spend time on the internet at the time, like looking at fan theories of what the show was about. So when everything was over and none of my questions were answered, I was upset. It's frustrating to miss the point of it all, isn't it? It's, it's, it's one of those things of, of feeling like you had invested this time, this energy, that you felt like you had followed along and then all of a sudden you're like, wait, that's it? I didn't get that. One of my favorite things to do is to scroll through Twitter and to see someone make a joke and then read through all of the comments that people put, and people are upset because they don't understand that it was a joke, and I'm always like, um, the article's from The Onion, so if you don't know that that's a satirical news source, then I don't know what we can do for you on the internet, because that seems pretty obvious. I love watching people just miss the joke. We get so distracted, and we get so enraged by things sometimes that we just completely miss the whole point. And we do this a lot, I think, with stories and scripture as well. We miss the whole point 
of what that story was about. Every December, we hear messages leading up to that pinnacle message of Jesus being born. It's part of our Christmas routine, right? It's, it's important for us to be in church those weeks because we partake in those Christmas traditions that we might have. And every December, you probably hear a message that says something along the lines of, don't miss the point of Christmas, right? Like keep Christ in Christmas. It's all about don't miss this single point that Christ is the focus of Christmas. But if we're honest with ourselves, we've probably already missed the point by that time and we didn't hear that sermon. As we're sitting here, we're probably thinking about all those, as we were sitting there, we were probably thinking about all those last minute gifts that we needed to buy. We thought about how to get a trip to Chris Kindle Market, making all those cookies, watching a particular Christmas movie. We have a list of things that we still need to get done and we're in church because it's part of that list, but we've zoned out and missed the whole point of Christmas, which is why I'm excited to be preaching the Christmas message in the middle of summer. When most of us aren't thinking about Christmas, and if you are thinking about Christmas right now, you're probably really prepared for everything in your life or they're somehow really weirdly obsessed with Christmas and I wanna talk to you a bit more to learn why that might be. But I'm excited to preach over this text because I hope we won't miss the point of this, of what is happening in this text. I hope we'll see the story of how God's story intersects our story and we won't be focusing on the Christmas season and everything that we need to get done, but we can see the story of Christ's birth in full. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Luke 2. The entire summer, we've been doing a series called Intersect, and it's been a series that has been focusing on how God's story intersects with our story. We've been looking through stories in Scripture, and it's been this overview and I, we've jumped around a bit, and that's the whole point of an overview, but hopefully each week you've seen a different aspect of Scripture and seen how that might connect to you. I think it's helpful for us to know a little bit about Luke's writing style before we jump right into the text, though. Luke has a unique writing style that sets him apart from the other Gospels. He's a storyteller. He's really focused on travel narrative. He's also heavy with his contrast. He loves to do that, this and this, and compare them and contrast them, and he likes to put very stark contrasts next to one another. We need to appreciate his style of storytelling, though, when we look at his gospel, because if someone were to ask you to tell the story about Jesus, if someone asked you right now, tell me the story of how Jesus was born, you wouldn't say, well, a long time ago, there was a man named Zechariah, and a woman named Elizabeth, and they gave birth to a son named John the Baptist. No, you wouldn't start there, but that's where Luke starts the story. He, has, he sets a scene and tells the story. Fred, Fred Craddock describes it like this. He says, Luke does not jump into the story of Jesus as Mark does. Jesus is not born until chapter two, verse six, not baptized until chapter three, verse 21. And while the reader is told at 323 that Jesus began his ministry at 30, the account of that ministry begins in chapter four, verse 14. But the reader has to wait to learn who he is and what he is doing. Such restraint is a mark of a masterful storyteller who knows how to capture and hold the participation of the listener. If anyone thinks that such attention to style is inappropriate to the high seriousness of Scripture, it would be well to remember that whoever is concerned only with content dishonors the content. I love this setup from Craddock. It does a great job at reminding us <clears throat> that when we focus only on the content, we're gonna miss the whole point of that content. It would be like telling my story, me telling you who I am, and completely forgetting about my childhood, where I grew up. Like you would see a little bit of me, but you wouldn't understand the fullness of who I am because you didn't know where I was from. The more and more you learn about people in life, the more you appreciate them and appreciate their story because you learn a little bit more about who they are. This is that idea that we read scripture and the way that we make these characters 2D and we think that they're just a personality type or they're just like some story, but they're 3D people just like us. And the more we know about their background, about how they were raised, about the culture at that time, the more we learn about those things, the more real to life these individuals become. 
And so it might be great to have John 3.16 memorized, but what's even better is understanding more and more who God is, what his love is like, his view of the world, and who Jesus is. We need to understand the context before we just look at the content. And so let's, let's look into Luke 2 then. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was the governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who he was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. I feel like I need some eggnog and a nice cozy, cozy sweater and to put on It's a Wonderful Life. I don't know, maybe you don't, but I do. A few years ago, I preached the same text and, and I went into a deep history of the Caesars and I think that you need to go back and watch that, not because it's my sermon. I was saying, go and watch all my sermons. No, go back and watch that one from December 2019 because I don't have the time to get into the context of the Caesars, but it's really important to understand that time and the Caesars and how they functioned. As Craddock said earlier, Luke is a masterful storyteller. Everything about this birth is the antithesis of the Roman government. That's the way Luke is telling the story of Jesus, that he would be a different king. Craddock says this, during Mary and Joseph's stay in Bethlehem, Jesus is born and like all newborns, is wrapped with strips of cloth to keep the body straight and to assure proper growth. The guest room was apparently occupied and hence could offer no privacy, so Mary and Joseph have withdrawn to a stable at the back of or underneath the house, perhaps in a cave. A feeding trough served as a crib. How simple and bare it all seems. At John's birth, there was a miracle, speech restored to Zechariah, and an inspired prophetic song, not so here. Lucas kept the story clean of any decoration that would remove it from the lowly, the poor, and the marginal of the earth. In the history of the church, there have been so many poor and abandoned as to be able to identify with this scene. In many quarters, however, the church has not resisted the temptation to run next door to Matthew and borrow his royal visitors with their gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Place a soft light in the major saw and fill the air with angels. Luke has a glow in this story, but it is shining elsewhere in the shepherd's field. This is why I like Luke's description of the birth. It's, it's, it's very different than what we read in the other gospels. He's quick to contrast it even with John the Baptist. He doesn't have that miracle. He doesn't have that prophetic song of Jesus being born. It's, it's very bare. There's not much going on. And a lot of us want to run over, as he said, to Matthew's gospel and get the, get the wise men and their gifts and get the angels above and, and place this in the story. But that's not what Luke does. He has, he has three people in it. He has Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but if, you were, if I were to put up like a nativity here at church that was just very dimly lit and just had Jesus and Joseph and Mary, people would probably be like, that's not fun. That's not festive. That's not what we want. But that's how Luke describes the birth. It's dimly lit. It's in a manger. It has a manger. And there are three people there. And that's when it all happens. Don't try to dress it up to be something it isn't. It's small, humble, and dimly lit. It's simple. And that's Luke's point. The birth of Christ was simple and many people missed it. Let's continue though. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all the people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those whom, with whom God is pleased. 
When the angels have returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem, let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was a baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Now we get to the part that we love, right? Now this is the celebration. We have the angels, we have the shepherds, we have all the good Christmas songs that come from this section, from this passage. We take all these details of the story though and, and we miss the point of everything that's happening. I have heard sermons on these details. I have heard arguments on whether it was a manger or a feeding trough or what it was that, pe- that Jesus was put into. And I've heard people fight if you say it incorrectly and say you don't understand the birth of Jesus if you can't get this right. We get so caught up in these details here. I've this is, this is just the, the most baffling thing about Christianity to me is that we fight over the most absurd details. N.T. Wright has this to say. He says, to concentrate on the manger and to forget why it was mentioned in the first place is like the dog looking at the finger rather than the object. Why has Luke mentioned it three times in the story? The answer is because it was a feeding trough, appropriately enough, which was the sign to the shepherds. It told them which baby they were looking for, and it showed them that the angel knew what he was talking about. We oftentimes try to make this a bigger deal than what it is, but it's pretty cut and dry. It wasn't unusual for a prophecy to be tried, for the details of a prophecy to be confirmed. To say it is a a manger, you will find the baby lying in a manger. Like, if you don't see a baby in a manger, then this is not an angel of the Lord. In Deuteronomy 18, it says to test the word of the prophet to see if it is true. And if it isn't true, then it wasn't from God. So it really is a way of saying, is this baby in a manger? Yes. All right. This is the son of God then. These were the angels. The angels saw it and told you this message to find the baby in the manger. The message would have been false if that the manger wasn't there. And that's what Luke is trying to drive home is that the manger, the manger, the manger, yes, it makes for a nice scene, it makes for this quaint little narrative, but the point is also like, that's what the angel was trying to tell the people, you can trust my word because it's actually a manger. He's using these items for something far more important. Luke is setting the scene with this and he's using all these items to point to something far more important. Don't get caught up in the weeds. Look at what Luke is pointing to. And T. Wright notes this, the birth of this little boy is the beginning of a confrontation between the kingdom of God and all its apparent weakness, insignificance, and vulnerability and the kingdom of the world. Augustus had never heard of Jesus of Nazareth, but within a century or so, his successors of Rome had not only heard of him, they were taking steps to obliterate his followers. Within just over three centuries, the emperor himself became a Christian. When you see the manger on a card or in a church, don't stop at the crib. See what it's pointing to. It is pointing to the explosive truth that the baby lying there is already being spoken of as the true king of the world. Don't miss what this is all pointing to. Don't miss the birth narrative. Don't miss what it is telling us. It is showing us a different way. A way not of the government of that day, a way not of what they perceive to be royalty. It's pointing to the fact that Jesus is king. Jesus is kingdom, but the kingdom of God is different than what we could imagine. It's funny, though, that we still miss this point today. We still miss the point that Jesus is king. It is one thing to declare that Jesus is king, but it's another thing to believe it deep within ourselves. For people who claim that God is in control, we seem to believe that we're in control most of the time. For people who claim that Jesus is king, we are still like the people of Israel wandering through the desert. And when God disappears behind a mountain, we quickly say to Aaron, quick, make us a a God because we don't know who to worship anymore. And so we make a golden calf. We're people that need to see something. And even though we might declare that Jesus is king, we will make anything else king if it is standing in front of us. 
What I'm saying is we don't really believe all the time that Jesus is king. We get so caught up with the arguments surrounding the manger and we forget what the manger is actually pointing to. We stop at the manger and argue every single point and forget that the manger is pointing us to something much larger. I grew up in a pretty conservative church. I could remember arguments and I wish I was making these up, but I can remember arguments over moving the podium or the communion table, which we don't have, but in like the old churches, you would have the the podium, which was an actual podium, not this sham of a podium, and you would have a communion table, which was somewhat of an altar, and it was a big, big kind of chest thing, and you had the elements up there. If you move that, you were desecrating the house of the Lord, and judgment was upon you. It was sacrilegious, you couldn't move it. Or, or when new music started coming into the church, which some of you might remember when, when we stopped singing some of the hymns as much and they started singing this new praise chorus sort of thing that repeated itself 20 times. I remember people saying that the worship wasn't pleasing to God and those who were singing those songs were not pleasing God. Or when people wore jeans in church I remember arguments over what we wear says a lot about what we think about God. Or arguments as to whether you could or could not have tattoos showing if you were on leading worship on stage. Sorry, Darren, you're out. No, back in the day, you wouldn't be allowed to. Or arguments as to whether um, you, all these different arguments that we had, and maybe that wasn't your background or your upbringing, but It still goes on today in different forms. We still see people making everything the most pressing issue in Christianity today. And when we do that, we forget that Jesus is king. Because if Jesus is king, can anything defeat his kingdom? For people who love to declare that Jesus is king, we have the tendency to dethrone him every chance we get. What we get from Luke's birth narrative is a simple story. It was a simple story that was meant to contrast the governmental and religious leaders of that time, saying they all expected Jesus' birth, the Savior's birth, to look like something else. They expected it to be royal. They expected it to be, to be big, to be fancy. And when Luke puts him in that very simple setting, he is saying, what you have thought is wrong And my guess is you're going to continue to be wrong with what you think God's kingdom is going to be like and what Jesus' kingship is going to be like. And we were, and we still are today. We still forget that Jesus responded in the exact opposite way that we do. The manger scene isn't a nice little decoration to be put up at Christmas It's to rebuke those who thought the kingdom of God would be like the kingdoms of this world, who expected the kingdom of God to come in and overthrow the government and become a a theocracy of some form, who thought that Jesus was going to ascend and, and lead us from a political standpoint, or people who thought that he was gonna come and completely, completely adhere to what they had been teaching in the synagogues, and he wasn't about that either. It was a way of saying, you know what? We've all been wrong. And we miss it today still. We miss that Jesus is king. As I said earlier, we may profess it, but we don't always believe it. Because if we truly believe that Jesus is king, I think we would stop spending so much time at the manger arguing about what it takes to truly follow Jesus, and we would spend more time seeing what the manger is pointing to and declaring that Jesus is king, and we follow him. He'll sort everything out. We follow him. The church won't die because Jesus is king. There isn't the greatest threat to Christianity because Jesus is king. Jesus is king, not a pastor, not a Christian author, not a politician, a president, and not you. Jesus is king, and that's what Luke tells us here. And yet we still get caught up in thinking that we know what that kingship should look like. And Luke says, if you think you do, you don't. 
the kingship looks different than anything we ever thought. We miss the point of the story though. Many of us miss this point because we're too busy arguing about everything else. The amount of arguments that surround the church on a given day on, on where people stand on issues, on what people believe about certain things. And it's just like, can we all agree on one simple and profound truth? That Jesus is king and we worship him and him alone. Not what we think to be true, not what we have believed all of our lives. We worship Jesus and Jesus alone. Luke tells us that in more or less words here in his gospel. The birth of Christ is, a, is an astounding story because it's simple and we've made it something bigger than what it ever was. We do these grand productions of Jesus' birth and Luke's production of Jesus' birth is one where there's no, obviously there's no budget for lighting and there's, there's no budget for extras and it's just a few people Stand, sitting, in the, sitting in the stable and giving birth to the king. And that's how Jesus led his ministry. That is how Jesus led his kingdom. And that is ultimately what his kingdom is about. My hope for you, my prayer for you, is that you're obviously going to hear this message again sometime in the next six months. And we'll say the same things that we always say. We'll say, don't miss the point of Christmas. Don't forget about Jesus this Christmas. Stop being so consumeristic and focus on Jesus this Christmas. We'll say all those messages because we, we truly want that and we truly hope that more people would focus on Christ. But we will also probably forget. We'll probably become overwhelmed with everything that is going on because it seems like every single Christmas, there seems to be more and more traditions that are added to your plate and to your life. But in the midst of that, leading up to that, remember this story. Remember the birth narrative today. And remember what it means that the birth of the king, that when Christ entered into this world, it was God's way of saying, this is like nothing you've ever seen and nothing you will ever see again. It isn't how you thought my kingdom would be, but it is how it is. And to this day, to this day, we have fallen, we have fallen to the trap that God's kingdom is different than what it is in Scripture. But to go back and look at Scripture and see this is what Jesus as King means will remind us that we have we have forgotten that today. And may we look to the text to move forward and continuing to shout and proclaim that Jesus is King today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful and thankful for you. God, we don't want to miss the point of, of what the manger is pointing to. So God, remind us of the fullness of what it means that Jesus is king, not just what we think it should mean, not just what we wish it would mean, but God, what it actually means. We love you and praise your name. Amen.
stretches of wisdom and things to be known are written inside your hand. In this fortunate turn of events, you ask me to be your
Sometimes we have bad days, right? Maybe you quit your job recently because of a rude supervisor. Maybe you worry for your child because they aren't meeting your expectations for what success may look like. Maybe you are more of a worrier than a believer. Maybe you just have bad days and cannot explain why and, are you, and you're trying your best to change that. And as I reflected on some of these things that can cause us to have a bad day, I was reminded of 1 Thessalonians 5.16, which says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You see, Scripture is telling us to be joyful in all situations. Whether you are sad, angry, frustrated, give thanks because we know that this world is not our home and it doesn't end here. Instead, it is our pit stop to continue on our journey to our rural home in heaven. So even though we face the struggles and the trials of today, we rejoice in the everlasting hope that can come only that can only be found in Jesus whose will for us is to trust in him and have no fear so as we reflect on communion this morning we rejoice and give thanks for the body that was broken for us and the blood that was shed for us you may take and eat and you may drink of his blood. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for giving yourself up for us. We pray that we would just continue to rejoice in all circumstances, even as hard and as difficult as that may be to hear that God, you just give us a glimpse of what it looks like to follow and, and love you and, and live a life where we don't have fear. Where even when we're angry, we find a bit of hope that leads to joy. God, we're so focused on this world and the here and now. Let us think of things that are heavenly. Let us let our minds fixate on you, God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.